Okay, today I'm going to talk to you about introduction to fluid mechanics. The first thing I want to talk about is before going over the definition of fluid, what I want to do is kind of motivate why we need to study it. Okay, as engineers, what we do is we basically apply physics and mathematics towards solving problems that exist in real life. One of the fundamental physics is called mechanics. Okay. So fluid, fluid mechanics, as the name recommends, is coming from the mechanics. Fluid mechanics is important for different type of engineers. For instance, when you pick aerospace engineers, what they do is they study aerodynamics of aerial vehicles, right? And they do study the propulsion systems, okay? I can also make case for the civil engineers as well. They study designs on rivers, dams that stops the water, right? Or I can look at the levee in New Orleans. They do, especially here in Florida, it's important to have drainage channels, right? So they design the drainage channels accordingly. Or sewer systems as well, right? And I can also make arguments for mechanical engineers, which I am one of them. We use fluid dynamics principles to design pumps. We use it for compressors. We design heating and air conditioning equipment. We generate power by using turbines. We have solar energy. How you're going to store the solar energy? So many applications from mechanical side. Even if we think about it, electrical and let's call this and computer engineering uh, disciplines uses them. They do make switches from using fluids. They do have displays they can use for data storage purposes. In addition, I can give some uh, anecdotal uh, examples. I would say there's only a few applications where fluid does not exist, okay? So you think about, as mechanical engineers, we care about the car engines, right? Think about the heating, think about the cooling of it, think about the lubrication, right? Or if I'm drilling for oil, then I have a drilling fluid, okay? If you look at the natural events, we have hurricanes here in Florida tornadoes in the Midwest, right? And we talked about this aerial vehicles, like if I'm designing an airplane for Boeing or Airbus, rocket exhaust, space shuttle re-entry to the atmosphere, or if you think about naval vehicles such as ships, submarines, even manufacturing, we have a water jet cutter. If you're using laser additive manufacturing or 3D manufacturing, you need fluid for that, okay? energy sector like oil drilling as i mentioned the solar energy right or for human health we talk about dialysis right artificial kidney filters there's a pore the, the flow goes through and two specific examples i want to give is one is a privately owned crude oil pipeline it's called trans alaska okay is an example here trans alaska pipeline and this is actually 800 mile and if you convert that to the si so it's about 1300 kilometers right and the diameter of that uh, pipe is 48 inches okay so a little bit over 1.2 meters and i need so much power for that actually there's 11 pump stations okay so what it does is it transfers the crude oil from Pruto bay alaska to valdez alaska okay so very important this is a privately owned okay i can give another example which is completely different how about our bodies Let's look at our circulation system, right? Blood vessels. And let's give an example of the pump. It's called heart, right? That's the pump. And then I have blood vessels, arteries, capillaries. And I have a question. If you look at the total length of the vessels, including arteries and capillaries in, our, in a human body, how long that is gonna be? One mile, five miles, 100 miles? No, the re real answer is 100,000 kilometers or approximately 60,000 miles. The problem with fluid mechanics is it's a little bit difficult because as we will study, you will see that there's something called turbulent flow. And the turbulence makes things very complicated. If I have a, if you look at the river, for instance, right? Different parts of the river is going in different directions with different velocities. So actually I'm not even able to analyze or rather predict pressure and velocity vector at any point in a turbulent flow. Okay, so now I'm going to take a uh, step from the mechanical engineering standpoint. So in the mechanical engineering, if you think about it, there are two main divisions. This is the mechanical systems.
and the second one is what we call thermofluidic sciences. Okay, under mechanical systems you will, depending on which school you're at, but here at the University of South Florida what we do is we give students for instance solid mechanics. They take machine design. They take kinematics and dynamics of machinery. But under the thermofluidic sciences, what we do here is typically the first course is the thermodynamics. Okay? And I'll be honest with you, what happens is that when the students first take the thermodynamics, they see this as a bit of a challenge and a bit of a distant topics, and they get a kind of cold feet from the thermophilic sciences, and most of us may prefer to go to the mechanical system. Uh, but after thermodynamics, then I can go to the this is fluid mechanics. So that's where I'm at, right? And the last course you typically take from here is something related to the heat transfer. Some schools have two fluid mechanics courses, fluid mechanics and fluid dynamics, or fluid mechanics one, fluid mechanics two, right? Um, in our school, for instance, we have two thermodynamics courses. One is called thermodynamics, the second one is called thermal systems, okay? So, but generally this is where we are at. And one thing about thermodynamics is it's a conceptual course. So that brings some difficulty into it. So then, let's talk about what is a fluid. If you think about it, it's generally known as deformable bodies. For instance, when I'm walking, I walk through the air, right? Or if I'm swimming, I'm going through the water, right? But I can't really swim through a block of aluminum, right? I will write the definition of fluid a substance that deforms continuously. So this word is the key, continuously when sheared. When I talk about this typically in the class, what students ask me rightfully is, hey, if I have a piece of block and if I push it on from the one edge, it is going to deform, right? That's a fair question and that's a fair observation. But I would like you to know that this word, this word makes a difference continuously, okay? So if you think about the river, right? What's the slope of the river? Well, majority of the times you don't even see the slope. You think that's a flat, right? But it flows fast, right? Because it's deforming continuously, okay? And let's talk about the shear, uh, shearing. Um, we kind of know that actually, as mechanical engineers, shear stress is related to tangential forces. Okay, uh, for instance, if you look at your steering wheel, if you hold your steering wheel properly, obviously, you're applying all the tangential forces to it. So let's give some examples. I mean, obvious examples that everybody kind of gives when I ask this question is water, oil. Right, okay, that's fine. And air, right? But let's go to tricky parts. How about honey? Okay. Um, that's a bit different, right? If you think about pouring or a maple syrup, right, on my pancake, as opposed to pouring water versus maple syrup, you'll see where maple syrup will take much longer to pour the same amount or same volume, right? The reason is we are going to study in this class, okay? How about toothpaste? That's a weird one, right? We'll study that briefly, undergraduate course. Or how about paint? Okay, so it's a, definitely a fluid but there's a different properties if you think about it what happens is if you dip your brush into the paint it doesn't drip much right it drips some but it holds on to the paint brush but then when you go and increase the shear stress basically um, onto the wall the paint leaves the brush and goes to the surface how we'll study that as well okay so now let's talk about the difference between solids and fluids a little bit further Okay, um, as I, went, I mentioned one aspect of it, when I apply shear stress, I will get small deformation in solids, 
On the other hand, if I'm looking at the fluids, infinite deformations. That is the important word. Okay? So that's how about intermolecular attraction forces? Okay? Obviously, this will be strong. In solids, if you think of a block of aluminum, it has really strong intermolecular attraction forces, but it is weaker in this fluids. Okay? And actually, one other thing that we need to talk about is fluids are separated into two as well, right? We have liquids and we have gases, right? So from my standpoint, the, the, the thing that differentiates these two is actually, you know, everybody by intuition can differentiate liquid from a gas. But I want to put some quantification to it, okay? Liquids, let's say that I have a bucket of water and a small container, right? Can I basically pour this to here? If this is a liquid, the answer is no for liquids. My point is, I have a given amount of mass and a volume over here. This is volume one, right? And if I want to pour it to over here, I will only be able to pour some amount of it. I'm not going to be able to pour all the mass that I have, okay? If I have a density, if I have a mass given to me, then there's a corresponding volume for that, okay? If, for instance, I have a one kilogram of water, it's going to occupy one liter. But if I have gases, there's something com compressed air, right? I can compress this. If for instance, this was a gas, then I can compress this and I can squeeze into this space. So in the gases front, I will be able to squeeze this significantly. So I will be able to change my density. Okay? I will talk more about it. This is just the introductory uh, segment. But I would like you to know that this is incompressible. I cannot really compress it. This is highly compressible depending on my thermodynamic state which is typically defined by pressure and temperature or other two parameters. Let's also talk about systems of units. This is important. Okay, Typically there are two very commonly used ones. The first one is the SI, International Standard. Okay, And this is the one that V as students typically know. Okay, Force is Newton. Okay. Length is in meters. Everybody knows that, right? Meter. Time is seconds. Force, length, time, let's give mass as well. Mass is kilograms. Okay? But the other one is called the British Gravitational, or I will call this BG, British Gravitational. Okay? This is a system as well. And in that one, for instance, force, what's the unit of force in British gravitational? It's pounds. Okay. Um, how about length? It is foot. There will be some problem associated with this, I'm telling you. The reason is that when I define my pressure, it will be PSI, pound per square inch, but the unit of length is not inches but foot, so we will have to do some conversions. That's one of the things about the British gravitational system. Okay? I'm just giving a heads up. Time is thankfully the same. There will be no difference between two uh, systems. And the last one is the mass. And students sometimes don't really follow this clearly. It's slug is the unit of it. Okay? So, for instance, if I'm using density, it's going to be slug per feet cube is my unit of it. Okay?